And we have Dr. Mark Harwood on the line from Creation Ministries International. And uh, he's, of course, you know, the resident uh, rocket scientist. Uh, he's done his uh, tertiary education at the University of Sydney. He did a, uh, a Bachelor of Science, Bachelor of, uh, I don't know what the E stands for. How are you going, Mark? Engineering, Mitch. Engineering. Going it, it, it was a Bachelor of Engineering. And he's got uh, PhD degrees and all those things. He's our rocket scientist, focused on radio telescopes and um, basically put the, uh, the Optus satellites into the sky. Is that all right, Mark? Uh, well, slight overstatement, Mick. I did have a lot to do with the design of the Australian satellite system. That's true. But it's a great privilege to be on the program again. It's great to have you here. Absolutely. And, of course, I've told everybody that if they need to know anything, anything in the world about aliens or anything in space, you are an absolute expert. <laughs> so maybe okay. we'll get some of those questions right. coming through. Hey, um, we, we do have a few questions for you, Dr. Mark, as far as... Uh, oh, by the way, creation.com is the place to go. If you have questions, you can get answers there's thousands of answers thousands of pages of information however while we have dr mark on the line it'd be great if you do have any questions to just text them through to our text line 0401 949 949 now dr mark um i've got a, a few questions today for you one is um how do astronomers uh, only because we've talked to um you know dr john and dr taz over the last few weeks and and we've got a lot of ideas on it, how they date things like, you know, stuff with carbon in it and even dating rocks or, you know, how they don't date them. But um, the question I have is how do astronomers get the ages of stars and planets? Because quite often they're saying, you know, this one's 300 billion years old and that one's 200 million years old. Yeah. Where do they come from? Well, well what they do Mick, is make uh, observations of the stars. They look at the the light which comes from them, they analyse the light and uh, conclude what's happening in the chemistry of the star, the physical processes. And, and, and that's all good observational science, you know, that's, that's excellent science. And from that, they build a, a model of what's actually happening in the star. Then they wind it backwards to say, well, how long could this star have been operating in this particular mode? And that's kind of how they get estimates of the ages. Um, so, you know, those estimates are probably not that unreasonable, but we've got to make some assumptions though on all these things because science always works on observations that are made in the present and we don't know what the conditions were um, in, in the past because we don't have the past, we've only got the present that we're doing our observations in. So they have to make uh, assumptions and normally the assumptions, of course, would reflect what they believe about the past. And secular astronomers today believe in the Big Bang model. And uh, your listeners would be familiar with that, how uh, 13.8 billion years ago there was this quantum fluctuation and nothing became absolutely everything, initially in the form of a hot plasma gas which condensed down and became hydrogen and helium. And, and that somehow collapsed and made stars. And so the process goes on and on. So when you have that kind of belief, that background, you then interpret the evidence that you've observed in the light of that. And when they combine those things, that's how they get the ages. Right. Um, but, I mean, you know, yeah. Go on. Sometimes they, they seem to guess. I mean, just recently uh, when Betelgeuse was sort of, uh, it was getting dimmer, they were saying, oh, yeah, it's at that age of its life where it's about to uh, go supernova. And then all of a sudden they went, oh, no, it's not. And like I thought, oh, well, that's right. <laughs> how did that yeah. happen? <laughs> And, and that, uh, that actually underlines um, really how little we do actually know. Um, you've got to remember, astronomers can only make very few measurements, really. They just measure the light which is arriving at their instruments, their telescopes or whatever, at this particular instant and from that particular direction. So they measure the, uh, the parts of the electromagnetic spectrum, its intensity um, and direction. And, and that's actually all they've got. And they then build models based on that. Now, that, that's reasonable science, right? You do build models. But what is often lost sight of is that the models presuppose that the universe made itself. Mm. But when you believe that the Bible is true, that tells us right at the beginning of Genesis that God created the heavens and the earth. 
Um, and he did it all in six normal length Earth days, just like the days we experience now. Mm. And it wasn't, in fact, until the fourth of those days that God made the sun, moon and the stars. So when you start with that as your background, then you end up with different interpretations of the data and the evidence that you measure today. Yeah. So that's how they get those. Uh, but you see, the, the funny thing is that the Big Bang model actually um, produces some very uncomfortable predictions. Um, for instance, um, it should say that there would be very primitive early stars that consist mostly of just hydrogen or helium, um, and they're called population three stars, and there should be lots of them. Uh, and then as stars burn up their fuel and explode, become supernovas, they produce more complex elements, and then you get population two and then population one stars. So you should see a lot of population three stars, but actually you don't. Mm. And this is a great mystery. So the observations really don't fit the, the Big Bang model. Um, but you might have heard of the, the James Webb Space Telescope. Oh, yes. I've seen some nice pictures. Oh, fantastic images that are coming back. It is a most brilliant engineering success. Mm. I mean, talk about aerospace engineering at its best. And that uh, started sending back data in the middle of last year, July 22, and uh, they were looking at galaxies at the very extreme edges of the universe. And they got a complete surprise. You see, very early galaxies should not be very big because gravity wouldn't have had enough time to draw all those stars together to make big galaxies. Yep. They also so shouldn't be structured like spiral galaxies and all this sort of thing, like our Milky Way galaxy, because once yep. again, there hasn't been enough time for the structure to form. Mm. So they're expecting to see fairly small amorphous blobs of stars out there. <laughs> but what they found were very big, enormous, in fact, highly structured, mature galaxies yep. that must have formed in just the first few hundred millions of years after the Big Bang, which just isn't possible. So yeah. it, it's just been a complete shock. Uh, however, I think that's entirely consistent with what the Bible says, because the Bible says that God created the stars and the and so on for his glory. I think it's Psalm 19 that says the heavens declare the glory of God. Yeah. So not surprisingly, as we observe these things, we should see the hallmarks of brilliant design and so on. And that's exactly what we do see. Absolutely. Absolutely. It is 26 minutes to five. We're going, going, going to go into a little break. And we'll be back uh, very shortly. Look, if you have any questions for uh, Dr. Mark, please just send them through to our text line, 0401 949 949. And uh, we have Dr. Mark on the line from Creation Ministries International. And uh, he's been talking to us about, you know, the age of stars and planets. And uh, we had another question that um, had come through from a listener a while back. And that question was, the stars, planets and universe appear so random. What evidence do you see looking at stars and planets of intelligent design? Well, that's a good question. You know, it's interesting. Um, people see what they expect to see often. And we're told over and over that the universe just made itself through this big bang. So therefore, everything's random. In fact, there's a principle called the cosmological principle that governs pretty much all of the cosmological models that astronomers look to develop. And it basically says that the universe is going to look the same in uh, every direction. But essentially what it means is that the Earth is not special. Now, if you believe that the universe made itself, basically what you're saying is there's no God. Uh, we, don't need, we don't need God to explain the universe. And if there's no God, then, hey, the Earth can't possibly be a special place. We're just a fluke. Yeah. Um, so anything that looks like the Earth is special is an embarrassment. But what we actually see is very different. Back in 1929, there was a guy called Edwin Hubble, and he made an amazing discovery that all the galaxies seem to be receding from us in every direction that you look in such a way that the, the further away the galaxy is, the faster it was receding. Mm. Now, I don't know about you, but if I looked in, in, in all directions around me and everything's moving away, that would strongly imply that I was in the middle. Yes. <laughs> and and uh, Hubble was horrified by this. And he actually said that, you know, this would imply that we occupy a unique position in the universe. 
But this is an unwelcome supposition, and it must be avoided at all costs. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, I mean, the observations that he made actually pointed to the reality that the Earth is special and that we are in a special place. Now, we're not exactly at the centre, but it would appear from the observations that the Milky Way galaxy is at or near the centre of the universe. Um, How would you know that, where the centre was? Well, you wouldn't, um, other than everything's moving away from you. So that sounds like you must be in a special place. Yeah. Uh, so what, what astronomers do is they, they measure this rate of recession and they, uh, and they do that by looking at the shift in the spectrum. It's called redshift. And the further the spectrum is shifted towards the red end, then the faster the galaxy is moving away from us. So they kind of try and wind it all backwards. And that's one of the ways, by the way, that they arrived at the assumed age of the, of the Big Bang universe. Um, yeah, right. But what, what, they actually, it, it, what they find is when they analyse these redshifts, that it appears that there's a, a very distinct uh, grouping of these redshifts. They're not just randomly distributed like you'd expect if there was an explosion. Mm. It's like the galaxies are uh, arranged on the surfaces of concentric spherical spheres uh, with our Milky Way somewhere near the middle. Um, but not only that, we find that on the surface of those spheres, there are massive structures that are billions of light years long. One's called the Great Wall, in fact. And, uh, you know, the, there's a thing called the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which has looked at over half a million galaxies now and has, has confirmed that the universe is highly structured it's definitely not random wow so when people say oh it's a random universe that's what we're told to believe um, but it's just simply reflecting the the belief that uh, it all just happened naturally um, and so in fact I, i've got a lovely quote can i share this quote with you yes uh, this guy called george ellis and he said people need to be aware that there is a range of models that could explain the universe for instance, I can construct you a spherically symmetrical universe with the Earth at its centre, and you cannot disprove it based on observations. You can only exclude it on philosophical grounds. <laughs> so basically what he's saying is, like um, Edwin Hubble, uh, if you don't like the Earth being special, then you reject that as a possible outcome. But that's nothing to do with science. That's all to do with what you believe. That's your religion, if you like, your faith. So well, I'm still trying to get my head around the fact that you're saying everything moving away. So every galaxy we look at from our point of view is moving away from us. There's not one moving towards us? Uh, no, there are some that do. Like in, there's a group called the Local Group, which consists of our Milky Way, Andromeda and, and a few others. Um, and close to us, um, like Andromeda, in fact, has what's called Blue Shift. It's actually moving a little towards us. Um, but what you're seeing there is a rotating bunch of galaxies, but the whole group is, the net effect is it's moving away. So by wow. far and away, the majority of galaxies have redshift. They are moving away. So the universe is, if you like, expanding. It's, uh, you know, moving outwards, which is partly what helps people have confidence that there was a Big Bang. But it's interesting the Bible says in about a dozen or so places that God stretched out the heavens. Yes. And you find that in the Psalms, in Jeremiah, Isaiah, various other places. Um, and, you know, it seems that on the fourth day of creation, when ma God made the sun, moon and the stars, that he stretched out the heavens to their vast extent. And there's a little phrase there in Genesis 1, and it says, and it was so, which means implies that that act was completed. Yep. Um, so it seems he did it all in that fourth day. So if that's true, then maybe that is in fact the basis of the red shifts that we see, because God really did stretch out the heavens. And there, there would have been no way when they wrote that part of the Bible that they would have known that was actually happening. No, no, no absolutely true. That that was uh, from the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. The authors wrote what the Holy Spirit prompted them to write. Um, and they did it without mixing any errors. Wow! And yeah, then, and then right. Hubble was the first one to actually see it. Yeah, he saw this expanding universe everywhere, but it made him uncomfortable because it looked like we were near the middle, and you, we we may well be. Well, and does he happen to be the Hubble who the telescope's named after? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. That's the man. 
very famous astronomer. Wow. It was a brilliant bit of research that he did, but he just didn't like the result because it made him uncomfortable. Yeah. Because he's thinking, wow, if God made this universe, perhaps um, perhaps he made me and perhaps I'll be called to account. <laughs> well, I mean, when you sort of consider everything's moving away from you, it does really make you look like a centre and it's like, okay, so why, why are we so special? <laughs> well, it sort of makes well, sense. <laughs> Doesn't it? Doesn't it? And it's incredible that you know, as just on the same theme of, uh, uh, you know, are we the results of random things? Our our planet is incredibly well and intelligently designed. You know, yep. uh, it's got so many different things that are necessary for life to exist, and that can't happen by chance. The odds are just stunningly uh, against that happening. And astronomers and cosmologists realise this. So they're really scratching to try and figure out how could it have happened just by chance, but they want it to have happened by chance. Wow. Wow. That's, that's blown my mind. They're all just moving away from us. Yeah. Yeah. It, and, and, and the Bible literally wrote that again. It's just another one of those so many things written in the Bible that, you know, so, so many hundreds, thousands of years later, you know, science says, yeah. oh, you look at this, and then you go, yeah, that was in the Bible. But but you couldn't have yeah. possibly known when it was written in the Bible. No, 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 indeed you couldn't. But it just shows how we can have total confidence in God's Word because it is the truth, right from the very first verse to the very last. And the amazing thing is that it tells us how we can be in relationship with our Creator God. Because he's reached out to us, he's paid the price for our rebellion against him, our sin, and he's made a way through faith in the Lord Jesus. And that's the only way we can come into relationship with our Creator. Yeah, wow. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you, Mark. And look, there is one final question. It's, it's, it's going to have to be sure. a quickie, I think. Um, if, yep. if stars are light years away and we can see their light then how can creation only be six and a half or six to six and a half thousand years old? Yeah, that's a classic question that comes time and again. Well, you know, the creation week was a week of miracles. So we can't really expect to be able to figure out what God did in each of those creation days because he was calling things into being that were not beforehand. He was speaking them into existence, including the sun, moon and stars. But people have had a bit of a think about it well maybe maybe there are some models that we might be able to uh, you know explain what might have happened of course we'll never know um, but for instance using relativity we know there's such a thing called time dilation and uh, time is not a constant throughout the universe and so as god stretched out the heavens that we were talking about before then yes that would have stretched the light as well wouldn't it if you think we were really close to a star and it got stretched away from us, we're going to see that light. Yes. Well, that's right. And and that could be partly what's causing the redshift, but it doesn't answer the whole question because the distances are too great. And so there are other, well, we you know, there are various models. Well, this time dilation model is an interesting one because you could have clocks running at the outer edge of the cosmos billions of times faster than an earthbound clock. And you need to remember that, of course, the creation week is written from an Earth perspective, the Earth days that we're talking about. Yep. Um, so there is a, a plausible model so that when Adam and Eve opened their eyes and you know looked up at the stars on the night of day six, presumably holding hands and gazing into each other's eyes, <laughs> um, <laughs> then the stars they saw would have been not much different from what we see today. Uh-huh. But the other thing, just to bear in mind, and, and, and look, there's lots of stuff on creation.com that talks about the starlight time problem. Um, but people are often not aware that the Big Bang has a big light travel time problem. It's called the horizon problem. And it comes about because the background radiation that is seen in all directions is almost exactly the same. It's very, very constant or flat, if you like, yep. implying that the remote temperatures are almost exactly the same. But at the Big Bang, there would have been hot regions and cold regions. And for those temperatures to have evened out, the hot areas had to transfer their heat to the colder ones to get an equilibrium. The problem is there hasn't been enough time for the heat to get from one side of the universe to the other to even out the temperature. Yeah. And they've got no physical explanation for that at all. They've concocted a story called inflation, 
but it doesn't have any physical basis. It starts for no reason, it stops for no reason, and you've got very special physics where matter repels matter rather than what it does now. Matter attracts matter, of course, through yep. gravity. So it's just a, a, an amazing story that they tell without any observational basis to try and fix their light travel time problem. Yeah. I think the biblical creationist is in a better position because he can actually use known physics like relativity as well as rely on what God has revealed to us in his word. Yes. And when you do that, I think you're better placed to come up with an intelligent answer. Absolutely. Wow. Dr. Mark Harwood, you know what? You said it years ago when I saw you at, I think it was the Impact Church out at Erina. You said it takes yeah, more right. faith to believe in that stuff. It would take more faith than it does to believe in creation. So, um, yeah, unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another yeah, awesome week. That's we appreciate great. it. <laughs> and hopefully we'll see you again next week. Absolutely. Same time, same channel.